very pleased to welcome uh, uh, Lee Deng from Microsoft Research. Lee Deng uh, did his PhD at uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and then he was faculty at Waterloo University in Canada, and then he moved to uh, 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 Microsoft Research in Seattle. Um, I've known his work for a long time where he's been doing forms of speech processing in some of more interesting ways than many of the other people he's actually been looking for, articulating feature-based and rather than just standard techniques of speech recognition. But more re recently, he's been looking at the wider aspects of machine learning, in particular uh, 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 deep neural networks, which are very popular at the moment. And um, he's actually now leading a group at Microsoft uh, Research looking at deep neural net um, technology. Thank you very much, Paul, as well as being So I'm going to speak up a little bit, maybe five seconds time. Okay, so first of all, I'm just going to assume most of you don't know about this one. So like last year, when we saw this graphic, uh, we had to review the deep learning to be uh, the top, you know, one of the most promising technology, which I kind of agree. And then this is actually, uh, you know, they all believe the CME sometimes. So this is my boss, uh, Rick Russell. He actually gave this very nice demo. That kind of prompt, you know, uh, some kind of hack. And then this is a uh, New York Times uh, article, uh, many of you may have read. They have two photos, one of the one is uh, Jeff Hinton, the other one, uh, the demo that actually was announced about one couple years ago. Um, you know, mentioned <coughs> this collaboration with Microsoft and in the transmission. So I'll give you a few more. Uh, and then you, you see that right after, just a few months after that announcement, you know, all the media came out you know, showing that you know, Google, you know, all these companies, they can use the technology for their own forms of functionality. So these are just a, light, uh, a little bit like a view to, test, uh, to show you, you know, the kind of impact. And as I work for my company, I have just had to also uh, let you know that oh, many other pictures so in fact, the Microsoft uh, picture to show that uh, now our search engine will also help uh, you to find better images of your search engine, even if you're learning a result of your course of being developed on an outfit, so I'm going to show you on this one. And then this is the study show that Facebook got with the people that was just a few months ago. And then Google uh, is the botless uh, company, or they have very, a very large number here. Field. And this is my community, and okay? many of you are sitting in this ICAS. So if you went to last year's ICAS, uh, you saw this uh, Chino speech that was uh, about one month after Jeff John. So if you click that, that few video and hear his speech, and, uh, how, many, how many of you went to this uh, conference? Okay, so some of, if you don't have a chance to see that, you know, it's nice to see, uh, to see the kind of views the change of views that Professor uh, Jeff had you know, before he joined the bank after he joined the bank. A lot of terms are different, uh, especially if you take it from an industrial, industrial perspective, things are very different from academic people. And in particular, he actually mentioned that uh, a lot of journalism modeling that he has been doing um, at, uh, at Toronto, uh, uh, you know, that actually sort of excited the whole field. Uh, 2006, uh, published, and, and that's how I got involved to begin with. Um, and he says that the only purpose of doing all this analysis is for academic creation. Uh, so people can choose what they're doing. Otherwise, they have a state. Um, and then, if you really want to know what deep learning is, so actually, I took this uh, photo from CNBC, uh, that was a few, uh, a few months ago. And they actually explained this kind of big, you know, big data. You know? uh, so, so the interview with the uh, CNBC reporter, uh, uh, he defined deep learning to be computers that learn and grow on their own. Okay? And this is a very bad definition. Uh, and then he went a little bit further, saying that you know, deep learning uh, makes computers to be able to understand complex massive amounts of data. And that doesn't give much you know, information either. Right? But you can see that you know, all the public media actually are very much you know, embracing big data, big learning, they so linked to each other, which, which is actually the right track. Now, I actually took this definition from Data Science 101. This is one of the website, you know, every now and then, I'm going to see that. 
Uh, and then actually define data in a little bit better way. And it's going to combine a few different sites uh, to say what the data is about. So, uh, so, the, so that definition coming from Wikipedia seems to be reasonable. You know, it's a set of algorithms in machine learning that attempts to learn layer by layer models you know, that represent those input in a way that can be automated by machine rather than a version craft design. And these are all good ones. So I'm not going to dwell on the uh, detailed definition except um, to first show you, well, this is the kind of material you probably don't see in the papers, to show you how uh, you know, several years about how I myself got um, into deep learning as Adam just mentioned to you. Uh, I myself, uh, I myself have been doing mostly um, uh, a graphical model type of uh, speech processing uh, in the past. Uh, a lot of things that I've been doing in the past uh, before I got to deep learning, you know, I kind of aim for interpretable, you know, modeling. You, know, you want really to understand exactly you know, the speech recognition, how articulation the process is going around. And to do that kind of process, it's very important to really know what they are so you can you know, debug your program errors and you can initialize the model better and you can actually see exactly whether the model can produce things that are sent to you. Right? And this is very, very straight. Uh, and then deep learning is kind of opposite. So, so I'm very excited to discuss it with everything today you know, how to bridge them together. Yeah, I might share a little bit of uh, you know, ideas to how this work can be done. Just making up some of the problems that deep learning you know, has been uh, you know, sort of attached to, which is very bad for the patient, despite the fact that it has a lot of good practical problems. Uh, so uh, to show this, I'm going to go through a little bit about some of the speech processing that I can show you how that kind of work actually naturally leads to, or maybe not quite naturally lead to uh, deep learning uh, excitement that we have seen so far. So many years ago, I'm sure many of you in this audience uh, have done your level, like 10 years ago, 10 years ago, including uh, maybe not the first wave of neural network, maybe the second wave of neural network that started in the late, uh, late 90s, and also, you know, not late, uh, late 80s and early 90s. There are a lot of uh, things going on. Yeah, I've been on to that a uh, long time ago. So I actually published work um, on using uh, so signal processing method to analyze what neural network prediction looks like. It's not linear prediction, it's the uh, neural network to do it. So the insight of this work is that you can actually use nonlinear prediction to predict sequencing, pretty much like the kernel network you know, in a certain way. Um, and at that time, there's no generative model. And there is no uh, GPU uh, you know, implementation, and then we were able, only able to do a very small amount of you know, database uh, to do processing. And the result is not very far from this conventional in the Gaussian model, you know, Gaussian, uh, model mm -hmm. etc. And then you know, it takes so much effort to relearn things, and a lot of people actually drop out of those out of the uh, including myself. Also, I think. So actually, this so this idea, but this is one very very few analysis that actually embed into. Uh, neural network that actually can do analysis on what kind of memory structure you might have on the neural network. So the theory is very nice and eventually developed into the one of the thesis of our PhD student, uh, uh, second author in this one. But at the end, it's mean, just too much, so much effort and the result doesn't, you know, wasn't born out to be very exciting. And then a lot of people just drop out, I think of myself. And one of the problems that I saw during these uh, early days uh, was that it's very hard to interpret what you do. You, you do neural prediction, and once you predict, you know the 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 the, the, the speech frames, like uh, the frame by frame, which is actually can be interpreted layer by layer. And then the kind of prediction matrix and prediction parameters are to interpret all this. And that's one of the things, uh, one of the reasons a lot of people actually, not only because just because the uh, you know the practical result is not better than the same, uh, but also the interpretability actually. Is pretty weak, you know, because by design, you use what's called the inter uh, distributed representation. That means each neuron actually represents different classes, and they're all, you know, mixed together in terms of uh, compositional, <coughs> but there's a compositional problems in that distribution. So, it's, it's, you know, by design, it's powerful because you can represent, you know, many different classes within one single neuron. But the downside of this is to make it very difficult to interpret. You know, some neurons have to, you know, to think about a lot, you know, to fix the problem. So a lot of people have to move to graphical model, and that was the time in the 90s graphical model became very popular. 
And then it turned out that hidden map model was a special case of uh, graphical model, you know, Asian and all. So a lot of people actually went into that, that problem. So I spent several years, uh, and this is one of the, uh, probably the most comprehensive graphical model you think about. So the top layer is the good sequence, and if the way you actually normally do it is that you have multiple uh, parallel, you know, kind of streams of the good units. You know, so for speech recognition, you will be, you know, um, what's called the chunk speech kind of feature hierarchy. And then you use that to control the language here. Now each dimension of, uh, so, so everything here that I mentioned about coding you know, as a sequence, rather than following sequence. Now for each different layers, you have articulatory uh, association. <laughs> and that becomes the driving force to drive a dynamic signal, which is done by, uh, by the other two layers. So people in speech very uh, clearly understood that, you know, speech production system as well as the perception system are uh, layered in terms of layer uh, application. Uh, people also understood that in the auditory system, in terms of perception, you have you know, the clear, the, 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 the many layers are uh, represented going up, and the production is much more natural to the the production system, you actually can actually design the model in such a way that you can make use of speech models. For example, uh, you know, the production of the speech in such a way that uh, you know, articulation doesn't really vibrate during the, you know, it doesn't really go up with that as much. You know, most of the time, you know, time doesn't move fast enough. And all this probably can be back in you know, this model. And for neural net, you can do that, obviously, uh, in an obvious way. You know, to, do, uh, to do that more intelligently require uh, some different things. And in graphical model operation network, uh, framework, naturally, you write down Newton's law, okay? You know, you know, just, you know, and, and then you make that problem very simple. You actually came up with something called the uh, switching dynamic, dynamic system of articulatory dynamics. So, so the whole point is that uh, using uh, this uh, deep, deep version of the dynamic version that you actually can represent some realistic process of speech production. And that actually is the real essence of generative model for you know, any kind of particular system. So now, I'm going to show you. So, so the main problem uh, of this type of model that everybody who is doing speech uh, you know, following machine learning will know that um, the inference is very hard to find, especially when you use good peak inference, and then, and, then, and then you have to use a lot of approximation. It's just like in a neural network learning, you do a lot of approximation. Right? So doing this is not an easy problem because when every time when you get deep levels of, um, of the model, uh, you actually write to the problem you know, of you know, making the approximation various type of uh, approximations to help you to have the decoding problem and then you can learn etc. So we explore many many different ways of you know, that, actually, that that was spent over about 10 years. Yeah, as I went to my graduate student that I went to Microsoft also pushed that uh, at one time I was doing a PR uh, in Dapa project. It's called Ears project I was a PR project Microsoft actually pushed that as far as we could. And the main part of that project is really to uh, simplify our um, our inference in such a way that we can actually get you know, practical speech recognition system going. And this is one of uh, the papers that we wrote to use a variational variational approach to approximate the uh, the inference and also learning part of that that model. It turned out that when we, when we finish all this, we actually get something slightly better than the the state of So I'm going to show you some of that. So some of the paper that we wrote over here. Let me show you. Uh, so this is one of the outcome by byproduct of that kind of variational learning method. So you actually, uh, so anybody know this is special web? So one of the hidden dynamics, hidden layers represent the formal uh, resonance frequencies and the bandwidth potential. And once you have that, you know, it's missing, you actually can generate speech part. So we model that part. And the way to generate the sound from this resonance to acoustic capture, actually there's a nonlinear explicit function you can put the back. So everything, you know, the theory is very, uh, very well laid out. And then when we, you know, implement all these um, inference techniques, we actually get very, very accurate uh, resonant tracking. And that resonant tracking actually just stays up. It's extremely, extremely good. Uh, actually, uh, uh, and we actually use this kind of result to label the database so that people, you know, doing this kind of research can research. Then, of course, we have to manually correct our errors. Those of you who are into this kind of you probably use that database that was generated by this, uh, by this, by this, by this by product. 
But once we go to the speech recognition decoding, we make almost as much error as a conservation of uh, standard conservation model. And at the end, they are very similar to each other because they all in the German approach. And then the error is, is a lot. You correct the errors that are designed to be corrected by you know, modeling articulate dynamics. So some sounds are very short, right? And then if the sound is very short, your articulation tends to skip you know, some of the major time, and that's reflected in this model. So you know, the reason why I tell you all this is because how, I'll show you how this two things you want to do. And this is uh, some of the results you know, shown in some paper that I have. So for those of you who know speech well, you, you may have seen some you know, 10 years ago I presented kind of visual results, very surprising. So, for example, um, if you look at, um, it's very hard to, to point out to you, you can look, uh, look at this spectral graph. These three instances of the sub, they are just coming from the same, same class. Okay? So, uh, so E, R, E, for example, I just show the, the format. So, the key is that when you actually use um, the conventional method, even if for short term, you actually get the exact you get you get just perfect, you know, resonance of this. Uh, you know, they look at different classes. Just because you have different contexts, you know, the speaking rate changes. Uh, so in order to make that system to be able to distinguish sounds, even if they have the same, you know, acoustic, you know, observation, yet due to different contexts, you have different class. Right? So the class, the speech class really is defined in terms of the whole big window of the class. And all this phenomenon was explicitly coded into Bayesian that you can do that easily. Because you know exactly what kind of people layer you want to design. Right? And then you can write down essentially the Newton's equation you know, with some, some, some simple uh, parameter, parameter uh, you can actually breakfast the office. It turned out that, uh, so this is the, uh, the result coming from, from that paper that is called the hidden trajectory model, for example. And we actually correct almost all this you know, short sounds where they actually so, so so that model actually can take into account the context left and right. Therefore, if you see a sound that you don't add, but you know the labeling sound as so and so, you will know that wouldn't be add, rather it would be ah because of that short. So all these problems can be prevented directly. So we can actually so this will show that um, you know, a lot of short uh, solar sounds you know, in the bar get corrected. So that particular class in this class of short forms, errors, are almost incorrect. And I'm very happy about this one. Okay, now, then Jeff Kinner came out. Uh, so, actually, he came to Kinsa. I mean, at, at that time, I think that was 2009. So, I kind of stopped working in this area. So, um, so actually, I show you know, him this kind of model. You know, so I, I said, well, I know you all do deep learning. Now, this is very different in several layers. And he was talking about general model. And then he essentially said that, well, um, uh, this uh, he's very good. He to look at it. Uh, he said, "What? Well, you have something there. How do you learn?" Uh, so this, this, you know, they have to do all the approximation, and then all the print you are making probably scrubs you up. Right? So that's why you only correct, you know, the, the kind of errors that you decide to correct in the model. But you may scrub something up right? if you don't do this global, you know, thing. Okay. That's true. Um, um, so, you know, so this suggestion is that why do you reverse all the reverse direction? Rather than going from top down, the way we are doing that is that we hypothesize, we hypothesize the it's just like a more standard conservation model. You, know, you hypothesize, you know, what kind of sequence you have, and then you evaluate the likelihood, and then pick up the large part of the printing the essence of the general model. And if you do a reverse direction, you know, you don't go top down, you go bottom up. There's a new uh, concept. Uh, and that's why well, I tried that thing 20 years ago, uh, and it never worked. Why do I have to try again? So, wow, but, you know, I think a better way of doing it, so we're actually inviting the country to work with this. Uh, so that happened in 2009. And then he said, well, if you don't know how to train this, uh, try to it to neutralize it. And this is kind of a very popular thing uh, five years ago. But now it's not normal popular, and I'll tell you why. And then when we, so, um, so, so when we started to you know, implement the kind of big neural network at the time, from bottom up, right? And then, we need to, that you have to throw away all the knowledge you have, right? And that's something I'm really sure. You know, I thought that you know, the other approach you know, takes, has so much uh, difficulty of getting, uh, getting this inference right. Now. I'm going to try something new. So, so the first time we tried, we tried on, uh, 
um, Timmy did that, and then uh, his student actually, uh, uh, actually started at first, and then we worked we work together subsequently. You can see that, um, so the, the, the key point here is that for the shallow uh, Gaussian Nature model, you know, uh, you know, that's what people have done that for 20 some years. You know, the error is about 27. For those of you who are doing you know, this task, you can see that it's a very, very good number. And then the work that I did to show you earlier for dynamics, after all these short sums are corrected, you know, and also a lot of uh, stop constant errors are corrected because, you know, because you, when you model the, 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 the context into the entire user articulation the kind of uh, properties, you actually correct not only whatever, you know, short sum you want to correct in the bar, but also the context of might get corrected as well. It's very good. And then we actually managed to increase the drop error from 23 percent, uh, 27 to 24 something. And then uh, this first time we actually look at the deep uh, neural network for the same path. It's about 23 percent. It's about one percent. More than one percent. Uh, and then uh, and this is more time. Right? So all people, you know, say, oh, okay, you, know, you have to change the whole thing. Deep neural network. And at that time, you know, we all know that deep neural network requires GPU to train. You know, and then and then and then the stunning discovery was that if you look at the error pattern for the first system, the one actually that I did, uh, the one I showed you earlier on, uh, and then there's a particular pattern. And then you look at the second uh, you know, the neural level error pattern, so actually I looked up carefully. So this task roughly has about 7,773 or something. That many tokens. And I worked for this task for about 10 years, 20 years, 10 to 20 years. I can't even remember what's the error pattern. <laughs> um, so I looked at it. Wow, so, so many different. The first thing I, I, I thought I, you know, I implement things wrong. That is, uh, first of all, I look at the DNA result. Uh, that was, uh, it's coming from you know, Toronto, you know, some student uh, there. Gosh, you know, you know, all the short sound, I know I'm not correct. How can I make a little mistake here? Right? Uh, I thought something was wrong. Um, and then I look at other sound, you know, some long sound, ah, uh, you know, all this, you know, some, you know, so the one, oh, they correct most of the errors. Right? It's a very, really just complementary error pattern. Is. And then despite <coughs> the fact that the overall error are very similar to each other, if you look at that pattern, so drastically different. In particular, the type of right dynamic model that I've shown you earlier on, those errors that get corrected get wrong. And you, you know there's something going on out there. So that actually motivated me to, uh, to start uh, you know, pushing uh, this kind of uh, research a little, bit, a little bit further. So now, another stunning discovery at MSR that happened about uh, four or five years ago uh, was that during that phrase of the one I was trying to explore many other type of deep learning methods that you know, Jeffrey can accomplish very well. And he did most of it in the image, like the auto-encoding level, like how to use the alternate uh, you know, code to represent the image. Right? And he found so this very, very well on the paper science. Showing that uh, the DNA not only can generate the right you know, digit, but also using a uh, bottleneck you know, constructed by big uh, autoencoder uh, that is much better than linear autoencoder using uh, using this linear method. So I was, you know, I was learning while I was doing, you know, trying to learn except for deep learning design, and then I tried to actually that that was my. Uh, but Jackie and I was in Kazakhstan, we would actually work together and, and we actually work out with some of the codes together. Uh, essentially, just say, wow, this technique, you know, you said it's good, you know, let me try my speech. Right? People never tried that uh, the feature encoding speech. And I said, well, why don't we just duplicate the same kind of big block encoder that you publish with image into speech to see how well it is. And amazingly, uh, uh, we found that this is another the special web feature, filter, filter bank, without even doing this filter, you know, mail is there. A lot better than technical features. And this is something um, people in speech probably mm, cannot even, even trust about that with that. But this is just not, and then we actually end up publishing one paper here. Um, and also, uh, most of the people here in speech will know that uh, you know, MSC capture coefficient actually don't this speech over the following 30 some years. Um, people actually just assume that this is the standard you know, speech feature. Uh, they, to do, and then this is the first thing I have to show that if you go back to the raw feature, like using a uh, short type Fourier transform, um, you know, you actually in terms of coding, you can look back. And there's something very uh, you know, like revealing, saying that you don't have to you know, trust whatever you know, tradition you believe in, 
uh, and then the, uh, the basic thing of deep learning about going back to the raw feature and learn everything from there on seem to be you know, sensitive. Right? And exactly why that kind of thing is good for GMF, uh, HMF, and other kind of things for all in the field, all kind of why. So this is, uh, actually this is the paper we wrote out of that exploration for deep quantum encoder. Um, and this is the right hand side, really just architecture, very, virtually the same as what was in the science paper for each uh, feature encoding. So we took the spectral web as a feature. Um, and then the one in the middle is a feature that we actually extract from that deep quantum encoder you know, as the code. So we manualized them as well. Uh, Code. And then we show that, uh, so next few slides, I'm going to show you some of the results that we got here. So the first, uh, the top uh, panel is the original spectral web, which is a logarithm of FFT. It turned out that in the beginning, I didn't even use the logarithm. I kind of trust that, not just FFT, and the end of research, research. Almost forget you know, a lot of this. Yeah, I forget about that. And then, and then at that time, we thought that. I mean, one that is so powerful, you know, not the, I mean, not the can be done automatically, right? so you don't have to lock, you know, if it's good, then you can use a uh, new one. It's not a disaster, isn't it? And then we say, ah, you know, it's kind of lucky, you know, a couple of people lock there, everything becomes good, right? So that means new one has all the power, right? So it's not a good uh, panacea to solve that one. A lot of uh, important properties so far has not been learned automatically, and partly because you know, that doesn't really have a very strong theory, you cannot simply just put everything there, hoping that good. If you know that, optimism can get you a global optimum. You don't need to know it. You just put whatever you need there, then using whatever theory that people proved 30 years ago, treating you as a, uh, what's called, a universal optimization or problem solving, and that is far from the truth. Right? And then, you know, so we're willing to explore. If you believe in the theory, a lot of people are coming to me and say, well, you know, 30 years ago, people already proved the uh, bank, you know, that's, that's some very famous uh, papers in, in, in 30, uh, about 30 years ago. That shows that if you grow your hidden limit large enough, you can watch any aperture from it. And assumption is that number one is infinitely size, but number two is that you have to have. I think I haven't read that in a group camera. They have assumed that you have global optimization somehow, not be better than you do today. And we, none of us, that's not what we need to try a lot of things. One thing is to try to put bottom of that and actually you not know, make it all of it more. And also, that also indicates that a lot of, a lot of uh, you should never take the current big neural network to be something that you think that is not a problem. A lot of uh, basic research need to be done in order to make the power of the neural net to be good. To be, to be and then the second, uh, the second uh, spectral program is the baseline system. So we use the 312 bits to code an 11 frame, like 2,000 two some you know, real numbers. And that's a huge amount of uh, data reduction. And then we show that uh, this is one of the best vector composition uh, and then I use the um, the weakness, yeah, I use the deep optical to reconstruct the spectral web using the same number of bits. So we design the experiment, uh, and the reason why we use the 322 is because we start with the vector penetration and we count how many bits it require. And then from that, so I get identical code to, uh, and by the way, the master is a uh, registered student, very good, uh, really good to know all these uh, vectors. It looks, looks pretty good, right? But you can see that when you use the 312 bits vector condensation code to recover the loose band, you, you see that there's some, some error, right? And then the third uh, spectrogram over here is the uh, big quantum encoder. You can see that they're more realistic. So the fourth line here shows that coding errors are found for time for both the blue and green, at the end red, and the red is much better. Um, and then you can, if you display the <laughs> error as a function of all the time everything you get, you know, you can see that for VQ code, you can lots of rest up here. And for all deep content code, you don't have this data. And then you show that. So this is evidence to show that deep content code is a uh, much better approximation to, uh, to, to use the small number of bits to represent a large amount of data compared with the vector computation. And that's very, very, very strong evidence. And then when we use MFCC to do this kind of reconstruction, we don't get nearly as good of uh, the you know, comparison with respect to the like, It can't give me the feeling that uh, our spectrum, you know, the, the earlier stage you go, the better it is. And of course, we may think that we want to switch away from, right? And that's disastrous. And, and, and it's not because deep learning philosophy is wrong. 
It's just because deep learning technique isn't good enough. And also the modeling you know, somehow has to be done more carefully. And then there are two different problems of the waveform. And then it just, I think you know, people are a bit too crazy. Actually, you know, people actually did that is from Toronto to school. I'm not saying I've never did it so far. But anyway, so in 2009, uh, so we decided to have this workshop, uh, so that NIPS workshop on deep learning. That prob this is probably the very first deep learning workshop on speech. Um, uh, so definitely, we also know that there is a good, there is a very good, uh, you know, um, a result coming out. Uh, uh, and then we actually worked a little bit together, and then by the time, so we thought that maybe this is the way to decide to you fail. Know, not to say more people to. So I don't know how many people are here in August went to this workshop in 2009 in, uh, in Whistler. Okay, no, okay. So, so the room actually is full. Uh, we have all the people you know, sitting there. And I gave a tutorial, Jeff gave a tutorial on people, I gave a tutorial on, on speech, you know, various level. And also I talked a little bit about error analysis. Now people are actually kind of convinced that this is the right direction to go. And then of course my company, um, you know, in the beginning is a bit skeptical. I managed to get a few people say, well, this is good, and this is good. And then I actually managed to buy a few GPUs. Three GPUs. It took me a while to justify what I needed to hear at that time. Um, and, that, and then after a, a while, uh, I think uh, Jeffrey can also came to us uh, again the second year. But anyway, uh, so we uh, decided that uh, you know, it worked well to, to, and we got a very good result uh, at the time. Uh, you know, for small tasks first. Now for the medium task, which is uh, you know, what's called a voice search task, and this is the task that, that we took. It's about 30 some hours of training data. You know, to go from 10 to 3 hours, that's about 1 minute of training someone. And, he, and we got one or two minutes to hire a training set. We want to see what it was. So at that time, uh, so that actually come back to this uh, issue of industrial academic collaboration. Right? And if we were to do exactly the same you know, technique as in, in 10 minutes, uh, you know, kind of technique, and the company, you know, our company is not going to make that to be best. First of all, you have to do so many, you know, so many, um, you know, massive terror and massive competition together. And secondly, if you don't do things carefully, you may even need to change our entire economy infrastructure. So the company is just not going to, to waste you know, all the reason. You know, for the, you know, you know Microsoft, we purchased this company called the, um, called the Tropic One many years ago. Uh, you know, the main reason to get that is that you know, we're very fast computer, a uh, fast decoding you know, software. You know, you, you don't want to you know, use new technique and then you know, throw away all my slides and new one. So one of the motivations that uh, that we actually go to from context independent forms as in that technique, the old uh, the experiment I showed earlier, to the new way of designing the hidden mark of uh, the deep neural network out of your really is motivated by our desire of putting the neural network technology into something that doesn't require any substantial change in the software economy. I think this part of the frame. So when you do collaboration with, uh, with the company, if you really believe something is good, um, not only do you want to fund your research, but also you have to think about what kind of minimum change you might want to make out of your technology in such a way that industry can increase. So it's very good at that time. Uh, you know, of course, uh, academic people have no idea about, you know, about this kind of requirement. You know, it's good that you know, if you academic, you know, good people working, start working with that people, you actually automatically get this kind of design into your design that helps you to popularize the you know, technique, and, and that's the exact kind of process we have going on through. So we actually um, went from about 200 to 183. For those of you who are doing that small scale experiment, that's really 183 you know, output. Now we can go up to about 9,000, 13,000, because that's exactly the kind of number of of for that you know content that we use. But once we interpret the output of the uh, deep neural network to be something related to procedural probability that you will compute using HMF, then you can simply just get rid of the Gaussian computation and replace this entire uh, uh, the, uh, you know, speech recognition system by replacing the Gaussian computation by deep neural net computation. And, and, and since, the, since the output of the end matches exactly the same as your uh, GMM, uh, HMM based encoding, it doesn't change you know, a lot of you know, infrastructure. And that's, I think, one of the main reasons why. 
the adapt, adoption of technology can go so fast. It's just within one or two years, you know, everybody is using that. And that actually will publish one paper on this. <laughs> and that can, and by doing is doing that. Uh, uh, and, 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 and I think two years ago in Kyoto, I can't. So my colleague had gave a tutorial. And that happened. We didn't even know. You know, it was so long. We know it's good, but we thought it's kind of a damn thing because of this, we're always encouraging our full time. Because we were actually, you know, we were right down. You know, we tutorial, we get three hours of tutorial. Um, for those of you who, who were in, uh, in, in ICAS in 2012, um, I mean, you, you saw that part, you know, the room is full. Uh, and a lot of the company, uh, that would be why you see down there. And then within a few months, a lot of companies started to pronounce it that, you know, they, you know all these uh, people went to the city. So it's very good. So, so and also I want to emphasize that experience about um, so the, the, the interdisciplinary uh, kind of nature of this kind of collaboration. You get academic expertise, you actually get engineering excellence, and also you actually uh, you know like, like GPU implementation. You know, most of the people uh, in speech uh, probably never thought about this. And the reason why is because. Um, because you know, our, we are very lucky in this picture for so 30 some years in Gaussian, uh, Gaussian picture model of HMM, uh, HMM system. You actually have VM guys with that style, and they're all extended VM yeah, computer. They are all parallel. It's called embarrassingly simple parallelism. Right? It's just your EM, EM algorithm by default, by definition, really is the you know, best training. Right? In neural net, you don't have that one, so you have to be a lot more common. And if we don't actually connect uh, ourselves, you know, as part of the industrial research, we have been accustomed to you know, the kind of uh, learning method that we have been learning for 30 years. It's very hard for us to think about changing the whole paradigm of computing for the learning. Uh, and because of the uh, requirement of being at for this batch, you call mini batch training, you, know, you, you essentially have to wait until this mini batch is done. Um, you could do uh, you know, a very large amount of batch training, but it's a waste of time. You know, data on that. We still don't even you need small amount, you just have to have many iterations. Much, much more iterations in the parameter update than the year algorithm. And that's the kind of thing, uh, you know, which makes the, um, which makes it necessary to use GPU to crank up very fast, you know. Uh, it's just because you need to update some time as well. So that actually, and also in order to make the system eventually uh, scale up to industrial level, you have to get a lot of Asia and all, uh, and then, you know, we have a whole team of people working together on this. Okay, anyway, so this uh, is kind of uh, summarize the lessons learned during that technology development from the traditional work. You know, first of all, I mean, the lesson is that you really have to be very um, careful in terms of spotting some strength of you know, system, some you know, local capabilities. I mean, one, one of the very important aspects of this kind of uh, innovation is to Look at error breakers. If you error are the same, we probably talk the whole thing you know, five years ago. And another thing is that you have to really to look into some industrial needs, uh, especially for this DNA, this kind of technology, which are very close to, uh, to, to, to practical use. And the industrial needs become a very important uh, aspect for popularizing some techniques. And then actually, turn out that more people actually work on particular areas, the faster they can very If the direction is right. If the direction is wrong, Stuck it forever. Okay. Anyway, so so let me go 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 some uh, let me go some a uh, little bit quicker here now. So this is just a summary of um, of speech recognition progress uh, using deep learning. Uh, so this is actually originally this diagram is coming from Nest evaluation. As so many of you know, right? You know, it's just going down a lot. So I cut out a lot of here. So if you look at some spontaneous uh, speech recognition, you can see that it started from. So that's just for tasks. It started from about 1993, and it'll be a year speech, I guess you know that one. And the initial errors are close to 1%, like essentially everything broke down. And the people work hard on it. Up until 2000, about 15 some years ago, 14 some years ago, you can see that it's plateaued, right? The error doesn't come down any further. Um, and then, you know, within roughly 10 years, you don't really see much. You know, sometimes the you know, errors go up or down. And then, you know, they're all based upon incremental. Our heart is pushing them very hard, and there's something, you know, um, you know, people have to just fine tune the system, right? And then, uh, and then at our S, uh, MSR, we actually, uh, in 2000, about 2010, 2011, that's when we actually dropped there by about, 30, about 20, 20, 25 to 30 percent. And 
then uh, so the other part, you know, uh, the, you know, with Russia, when he gave this demo uh, that we think he's trained, <laughs> he's very cooperative. You know, about two years ago, when Rick Ross, he, he tried very hard, he wanted to be the public, right? Uh, you know, he wanted to do demo in Shanghai in 2010. Uh, I was busy, you know, uh, you know with that, you know, trying to see uh, whether, um, whether I can help. And he essentially doing the practice. You know, every time he said, he said, oh, you got an error here. And every time I do that, the microphone turned away, right? You know, you know, the error, you know, was all over the place. So we turned out to cancel that demo in 2010. But in 2012, once this type of thing happened, he became much more cooperative. He said, teach me, how do I ask you, how do I send one? So we talked about it. And then everybody dropped out of the 7%. And that's how it makes that real-time demo of uh, representative and real-time demo of the There are a lot of people in MSR Asia that you know, have to do this kind of work together. And then, uh, so this, if you really want to know some reasonable, recent, Reasonably recent overview of this field. Uh, we actually, uh, Jeff uh, and I, and a whole bunch of uh, other researchers, we wrote this overview article that was about two years ago. We started writing and then it appeared about one year ago. Um, and then he uh, he's very good that he managed to get you know, Google people to join the opposition, Microsoft, and also uh, IBM. So we got the, so the name is the, the shared views of four research groups. So we actually circled. You know, paper many times, and people sort of all agree to the mean expression. The so this is, this is a still reasonably updated version of uh, the learning history, and some basic ideas, and some of these are actually really Okay, so let me see. Um, so this is practically the uh, the infrastructure, uh, the, the model structure that allows you to do deep learning for speech recognition. And the reason why I put this you know, state over here at the top so big is to show you that when you use the company dependent uh, phones as a unit, you actually you know, need to. And it turns out that the, the fact that it's big doesn't, doesn't hurt you. But it actually helps you because our decoding infrastructure is essentially static. Right? So everything is in place, and then you actually just replace the inter to the posterior probability calculation portion of the GMS, HMS, you're using uh, HMS. So essentially, you have to match the input to the HMS and the output of the end. If they do the match, you don't really change much of the coding. There are some change. Uh, you know, you have to make sure that all the metrics are going to get So I have that start matching here. And other than that, you have to search uh, complexity and search uh, software infrastructure. They stay more than the same. And that actually really helps to compromise. Okay, so let me summarize the result, okay? And there's a good lesson to learn from this summary. So, uh, many years ago, how many years ago? Four, uh, four or five years ago, you can see that in Timid, uh, there's about three hours of training data. You've got some around one to two percent, about two percent of error. Uh, and then, uh, and this is done by uh, MSI, we use about, you know, roughly about one of the metrics more data. That's how it works, so different tasks. And then you can see that the error rate also. So the first one dropped about 10% relatively. And the second path, you increase the data by a fold, a tank, a tank fold. You actually drop error relatively by about 20%. And that doesn't happen often, right? Your small task, you get some gain. Your bigger task, you get more gain. And then there's uh, my colleagues in MSR of uh, Asia, uh, with 300 hours of switch ball. Then look at this. But when you increase the data by another tank fold, 300 some hours, you see that the error rate dropped by even more, so roughly 30% error rate reduction. Even more, and later on, in the 2000 hours, that's also my cover. And also, this all research are now duplicated by, uh, by IBM, by everybody. Everybody sees the same thing. I think this is more than tough for some people here. They, all, they actually uh, have this 300 hours of time. And then, and then this is the number similar. Now, this number is dropping down a lot more. I prepared this slide for a while ago. And then, once you put another kind of all the main student groups about 2,000 hours, the actual error, but relative uh, improvement roughly stay about 30 percent. That's a very impressive result. Uh, and whereas in the speech recognition industry, uh, if you see this, uh, uh, you know, the, the historical development of speech recognition, usually for small tasks, if you get error reduction, usually not 80% of the time doesn't generate too much time. And there are many reasons for it. And this is uh, the end, it's just opposite. So everybody look at this result. There's no Nobody in their right mind wouldn't use this technology, especially for industrial application. And 
as well. Okay, we're going to not make this again. And then it turned out that and then Google has even more data. They, uh, the first experiment they show is about 6,000 hours. Yeah, I think I'm going to go through all the detail about this. Okay, so now, um, and that's pretty much summarize the development of deep learning up until the years ago. Close to where I, uh, the paper I was published. And then, of course, a lot of people in this specific way, they keep saying, that, well, you know, uh, now this is the old technique, it's a circle, it's a bit bigger, faster, the GPU is there. Actually, that, that, that actually is totally not true. Okay? So, uh, about, about one year ago, uh, so Jeff and I, you know, yeah, we discussed exactly how, um, you know, how speech communication, uh, recognition, you know, coming to think about this deep deal there. We believe that this is really, really, not only just the empirical result, but also there are so many new things that we're putting there. Uh, not just legal trick, but also some conceptual difference. So about one year ago, so we thought that, well, how about, uh, how about, uh, let's summarize what are the new things compared to about 20 some years ago. So, you know, so we, you know, we both you know, were doing some, uh, he just been going throughout all the years. You know, I was doing you know, already, so about, let's still keep doing some relationship. So how about we summarize uh, new types of uh, the learning method and the model uh, for script recognition. So we actually you know, got IBM, uh, first of all. I did it to get Google, first of all, also. And then I totally has the limit. To open a special session, you can't have more than three one. Okay. And then they call the image of Google. That's fine. I think we can put together. Um, anyway, so we actually saw about one year, uh, close to one year ago, we had this uh, com uh, conference uh, in Vancouver. Summarize um, some of the new uh, aspects of the deep uh, neural network beyond what people have done many years ago. And then let me, let me give you some a very quick summary of this. So, actually, in this special, uh, and of course, we invite ourselves to my paper on this summary uh, because we know that those groups are the ones who did all the initial uh, neural network. So, we we'll probably get more experience than anything else. And then also, we also invite less uh, uh, from it's um, what we call a related publication, not a special publication. So each side share uh, their labs. Yeah, we're open, but it's very nice to open. I think community really open really is the, the key to push technology forward. But now we're talking about as open as <laughs> what we know. There's such a huge amount of application. But anyway, we're well, still pretty open. So at that time, I think every side really tried their best to present their, you know, their, their most updated research. And the goal is to present something that goes beyond what they have been doing. Uh, you know, <laughs> um, and then uh, and then we summarize a few things, right? So we actually you know, about five minutes, okay? So we actually get a whole bunch of people together and then all our three organizers so we look at it, we summarize them. And actually we wrote the paper to summarize them all. So the first uh, thing is that we get better. And, and it's a lot of people say, well, that's not bad, it's just more original than the so, uh, so actually, I should put that. Nice. So, uh, about one year ago, uh, we, as I told you, we changed from MFCC, uh, uh, male capture, male frequency capture for This is 2013, you know, kind of the standard uh, feature into log male spectrum. The one I show you. Uh, and now, actually, just a few months ago, in SRI, I think I'm trying to put it in there. And we, we saw IBM's paper that basically get rid of men. And then and a lot of the sites basically try to get rid of log. Uh, I was doing that original one. And you can automatically learn the application function. And if log is really important, you know, it should be, you know, it should be automatically done. You know, I didn't like that. So I talked to some of the students, well, they try to do so max out uh, neurons that cloud people are developing. The, the purpose of that neuron is to try to replace any kind of computation. So if, you know, who tells you log is the best? Right? So, but then, about one year ago, log is the best. So at least we go one step. Uh, Back to the raw features in the speech, inconsistent, in, in, uh, to be consistent with the deep learning philosophy. Right? Going back, and then how many steps we want to go and you know, how well people work. And another, uh, the second thing is now we have better linearity. What the, so the neural network, historical historical neural network development, of, almost always is just kind of situation on both sides. So now there's very nice yields for the uh, rate, uh, so, so relative yields, linear uh, rectified yields. 
that actually substantially speed up the learning. And some sites like IBM, they actually report that they get better practice. I've never been able to report it. I prefer to myself. You have to know which you have to learn, make it learn rate to be small. Because you know what? Uh, this one I don't. A lot of people are so I mean, uh, no one like, don't think about you know, like a recipe to do it. You understand why? The reason why you have to reduce the learning rate is because once one site is getting unbound, right? if you update using the same learning rate as the um, as the signal, you, know, you actually you know, tend to lose the So you have to be very careful. And I try my best. But I, I actually increase the uh, speaking of uh, the learning process. Uh, uh, so, so this result is still uh, not clear. It's not, it's not like you know, the early success of the you Once know, you get, you know, actually we talked a later in transaction uh, of speech and language processing. You know, everybody can do it. So it's not that simple now. And then also another innovation here is that architecture-wise, people start looking into recurrent and recurrent. And this, this is actually so a large time I speak, uh, uh, discuss with a number of students here and try to convince you that what is important. And that's really due to the fact that all the crew just we had, you know, about, about, about to this slide ago. Then we start to know. Now we start to look into more seriously those uh, clues, how to get rid of it. One of the ways of getting rid of big window clues is to you not know, do recurrent at all. But of course, that also presents some additional challenge. And then another important uh, new architecture was the conclusion of new article. People have shown some really good progress on this. And what that has shown that I'm coming to a bit from this. At the end, also shows the success of the group. But you have to be very careful taking into account speech knowledge. And then optimization also is become drastically different from the old days, uh, you know, neural network learning. And then now we have this asynchronous as a GD, so kind of the same kind of thing. never be actually many years ago. And actually, I think it's true duplication of free optimization. That's really uh, it's, it's effective when you do sequence learning. And then the lesser of accelerated gradient method also has been used to speed up the learning and the gradient clipping uh, technique. And actually, uh, there are no other techniques related to this gradient clipping. And there are some theoretical justification for uh, learning the recurrent method. Otherwise, the gradient will explode. All the types of And all these problems have been understood now and not in years ago. Uh, and, and, and because we understand this optimization problem, um, you know, people researchers. Uh, that we typically uh, done by uh, Benjamin's group. And they actually come with some very nice technique to solve that problem. Okay, and, and then come regularization that never had, you know, people never thought about you know, doing all this uh, until some years ago. And what is dropout technique, I think many of you probably know about it, don't have time to go through. It's actually just chill on your own. Right? And then you can actually, so in, uh, in, in NIPS just a few months ago, there are so many papers there just to analyze why this one. But guys, a lot of really hard code so many people that actually take that very seriously. Um, and then although you know, the first time you present that, you know, Jeff Hinton originally presented that paper, and I had an audience ask me, are you sure you have to buy a in the program to make it work? Because it's a pure neuron. Maybe the student by accident <coughs> set some neuron to be zero, and then as it's an accident, you see this good result. Right? And that's normal. I mean, there's a direct analysis for what you want to do this. And then you just pass it to me, uh, he said, yeah, these are all new. And then finally, um, a very important thing. And these are all, all these things I talked about were published in the special session about why we got in my class. I think 11 months ago. 10 months ago. And many of those are still ongoing research. Right? Some could show that it's successful, yes, it's just some could you know, have a good degree. And that's probably our uh, hyperparameter learning. So, you know, using Gaussian prior techniques, and there are a lot of people working on this. Very pretty if you want to do uh, large scale learning. Uh, but if you do some toy problem, don't worry about it. Okay. I hope I can register that. They can feel more familiar about that. So maybe you say you don't need to do this. That's all we can do. Uh, Come here, we really have to do that. If you don't do that, you know, we just can't afford to hire someone to make to, to children. Uh, and then finally, okay, okay, so this is the final one. Uh, there's a, something called the market task learning. And, they, and these techniques were presented about, one, uh, about 10 months ago. And people never thought about that. You know, that is and the whole point is that big neural network has this capability of learning the representation from multiple languages. And that gives you some 
internal representation, and that representation can go to different kinds. So I think it's more like uh, many, many uh, students who work on this uh, uh, ICAFA project, they use that technology, and then we publish the final papers. So basically, just in that conference, in that semester session, five papers, and the two papers talking about this technology. This is our most mixed bandwidth acoustic model. Uh, in old days, like we have uh, you know, 8 kilobits bandwidth and 4 kilobits and, and then you know what? Because uh, in old days, all the special data are from telephone, right? And then all of a sudden, people change the smartphone that's you know, right back from you know, 8 and then, and then you could throw away all the data and you just new one, right? And then it takes a lot of effort to you know, get And then what's the best way to, you know, to bridge you know, to make use of that 4 kilobits of data? And this is in our company, we have a lot of things about this. And we don't want to spend all time on getting a lot of money. So in the old days, people do bandwidth extension, right? You extend, you do something, whatever, doing that extension, and then you pick up the And then after you do all this effort, you put the game, right? Because the data are a different data, right? You kind of, you know, the technology is working. All we have to do is that we just, you know, for the other back to zero data. And you don't even do extension. And then you change the new data, train them all together. And that helps, fair, you know, by fair around the budget to boost the uh, recognition for the smartphone data. So it's not like, I mean, that's basically uh, what the lot of mistakes is with the class learning. Okay, uh, so anyway, so. Okay, um, so I'm, yeah, so I'm just one more thing. How about skip this? You know, a lot of speculation to, you know, uh, what kind of problem can be good for deep learning to solve? What kind of problem may not be good for deep learning to solve? Yeah. So, so that, since, since there is a lack of theory in deep learning, Everybody agrees that the theory is not able to develop. And then so far, we can only empirically you know, either evaluate you know, different paths to deep learning or to speculate based upon your, you know, if you are really deep learning in the area, you can use whatever you know, reasoning you can have you know, about your brain. You know, a lot of people don't like it. So, so I'm going to emphasize this. I'm just going to show you that my personal kind of hypothesis, at least on five, five, five to eight different paths, but not always which I will uh, on language. So I actually, uh, actually we published a paper in malware detection in my class in the last week. And there are many tasks that well, you work on this. You kind of get some set, right? So it turned out that, uh, I, uh, well, I wouldn't say it turned out, it's just my personal experience is that anything that's related to perception, you know, the vision, the, you know, maybe touch, maybe, uh, that kind of task that requires, I mean, if the human uh, perception system has this layer structure, they tend to move much. Right? And, and vision is a very good example. Uh, in language modeling, uh, the, um, they have uh, some very good results. The language uh, really is even deeper than the speech. Right? And this part, I firmly believe that you know, the learning will happen. But if you are doing some machine learning problem, then you know, they can't match that recommendation. You know, just you know, estimate what entry you, know, you have to fill in, um, like recommenders. You know, maybe it's less useful. So this, this whole point was speculation. So rather than, uh, rather than uh, uh, yeah, so many of these perceptual related AI deep learning already show some very convincing evidence that is good, despite the fact that still, there is still lack of theoretic uh, foundation. And deep learning may not win over standard machine learning tests if the task is simply involves some data matching. If you're away from perception, it's not likely to be deep learning. So don't think about deep learning to be something that will happen to someone. Okay, so now in terms of three, in terms of the direction of deep learning, I think number one, we still need to have better speech model, uh, better deep learning model. So far, so as I discussed with uh, many students today uh, in the morning and also um, at lunch, uh, many people think that deep learning is just one box. Uh, no, no, that's, that's not that true. There are a lot of you know, uh, sort of uh, aspects of deep learning that I showed you earlier on. Uh, there's, uh, there's a great need to have better models. In particular, we need to have very good theoretically just like that. So, uh, one hour I spent uh, one hour with uh, Eric Singh, Professor Eric Singh, and we brainstormed a lot of in how to bridge his expertise of graphical model, the one that I stumbled on a while ago. And, and, and perhaps uh, three or four years from now, or maybe two years from now, people actually can really <coughs> blend these two styles of learning together so people don't really see any, um, any difference. Uh, so, therefore, they should have layers and layers of the generative model will probably help us so how to blend them together. And one example of blending them together was the original deep learning philosophy. You get DBM to pre-train and then you use uh, you know, uh, fine-tuning.
tuning to do uh, to tune and learn, but that's not important. And that, that's not my theory. But I think that way of learning probably can benefit a lot more by understanding the power of interpretable information and all kind of uh, like. But most people don't do very good. A few, you know, the top model, you can write them to a few layers. But now, if we have better uh, learning methods for, and also primary transition method, you know, the global application, the global application, uh, how to code your output, right? not just using you know, 30,000 or whatever. That actually leads us to code, like we want to put a new product into this one. But now, what we have done to build this product, that was a much better way of coding that. You don't, you don't want to know about 30,000, you, know, you have to custom and you have to design. Of today, this is really some structure. We already uh, talked about uh, Eric uh, very on well. how to actually code them in such a way that's most efficient and also most effective you know, for theory to, to, to kind of. Okay, that's pretty much I have here in education and then uh, learning structure. So just advertising on, so in ICAST, I also will give a lot of tutorial on natural language possibility for the future chance. Okay, thank you very much.